So my name is Ola Hersher. I am professor of mathematical statistics at Stockholm University. I'm also part of the board of Scandinavian School of Theology. And I'm very happy to be part of this uh, uh, creation webinar this day. The topic of my talk is uh, why is creationism science and what characterizes good science? So this is a topic within philosophy of science. And let me start by giving an outline of my talk. So I will first talk about what science or natural science is, like biology, physics, geology, chemistry, and so on. And then I will talk about the three major Christian approaches to questions of origin in science, uh, like the origin of the universe, the origin of Earth, the origin of life on Earth, the origin of mankind. And these three major approaches are young Earth creationism, old Earth creationism, and theistic evolution. And then I will go on discussing what defines good science and science that's not so good, and the most established method, so method of science or empirical science is, is referred to as the hypothetical didactive method or the inductive deductive method. And uh, uh, this is the most established method of choosing between scientific theories. And in this context, context I will also talk about or ask the question, why is creationism marginalized within academia? And my conclusion is that uh, creationism, in spite of this, it does in fact satisfy the requirements of the hypothetical didactic method of science. And, 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 and therefore, my conclusion is that creationism is good science. So let me start talking about natural science. So the aim of science is to find the truth about the world or attain knowledge about how the world functions. And uh, we want to sort out, systemize our knowledge about the world. So uh, the, this knowledge about the world that we attain through science is represented in terms of scientific theories. Uh, for instance, uh, 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 Newtonian mechanics is an example of that. Or in the picture here, we see Einstein's theory of relativity or quantum mechanics. These are all scientific theories within physics. The scientific theory within genetics is uh, Mendel's laws of inheritance. And these theories uh, typically involve some initial conditions, how things looked at the start, and then laws of nature uh, that describe uh, what happens uh, over time. And the scientist has a toolbox uh, to use in order to uh, attain knowledge about the world through, through science. And the first tool is data. We need to go out in nature and, and uh, collect data and observe uh, things. And secondly, we need to formulate different theories or hypotheses, H1, H2, and so forth. Uh, that describe how the world possibly could function. And then we uh, want to test this theory uh, with data and find out which theory explains uh, data the best. And in order to do this, we use logical reasoning uh, in order to evaluate how good different scientific theories are. And uh, the framework of doing that, the framework of singling out the best scientific theories is referred to as a scientific method. So the scientific method should address what makes a theory good and what makes a theory less good. And uh, a scientific method should also address which scientific theories should be able to compete or should be able to be tested in the first place. Uh, and a very important question 
of the scientific method is whether it allows for theories with supernatural ingredients or not. And uh, speaking about uh, supernatural uh, events, that brings us to the question of the Bible and science. So the question we might ask, uh, can science use data from the Bible? And let, before answering that question, let us simply talk about how, the, how Christians uh, look upon the Bible. Well, for Christians, the Bible is the word of God. And since God is the truth, that means that Christians look upon the contents of the Bible as being true. And since the aim of science is to find the truth, uh, the Bible should not contradict science. And uh, the Bible, it, it not only contains sort of individual revelations from God, although these passages are very important parts of the Bible, but the Bible also contains a number of passages that, that make claims about the world. And that includes the first 11 chapters of the first book of the Bible, Genesis, how God created the world, the universe, life on earth, how God created mankind, the fall of man, uh, the flood of Noah, the subsequent uh, uh, geographic and li linguistic dispersion through the uh, Tower of Babel. But throughout the Old and the New Testament, we also have a number of historical passages. And these uh, Bible passages uh, uh, Several of them involve supernatural events, like uh, God creating uh, the universe, the earth, simply by his word, and God creating uh, humans without further living ancestry and so on. So these are supernatural events. But uh, uh, these events, they can still be tested. And Christians have different views on, first of all, how to interpret these Bible passages, in particular Genesis chapter, chapters 1 to 11. And they also have different opinions on whether these uh, is the Bible passages that contain supernatural events, whether they should be part of a scientific theory or not. And this is uh, in particular important for questions of origins. When we talk about the origin of the universe, the origin of the earth, the origin of life on earth, the origin of humanity and so on. Because for questions of origins, it's not possible to perform experiments. We, we, we cannot uh, uh, go backwards in time. And, and for that reason, faith assumptions or paradigms become much more important when we uh, do science and try to answer questions about origin. And the paradigm is a framework within scientific, within which scientific theories are formed. And uh, there are, as I mentioned before, there are basically three Christian paradigms for questions of origin. Young Earth creationism, Old Earth creationism, and the theistic evolution. So let me describe each one of these three paradigms in more detail. Uh, and uh, they rely on different interpretations on the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis in the Bible. So let's start with Young Earth creationism. So according to this paradigm, uh, Genesis chapters 1 to 11 are interpreted literally. And that means that uh, the world was created about 6,000 years ago, uh, interpreting uh, the first chapter of the Bible as a, a literal creation week, and then uh, looking at genealogies from 
Genesis chapter 5, for instance. It also implies that what God created initially was good, no suffering and no death. And that we read from the first chapter of Genesis. It also implies that the fall of man was a real event which affected not only the relationship uh, between man and God, but nature itself was uh, affected so that death and suffering came into the world. The young earth creationist approach also implies that the, the flood of Noah and his family the, was a worldwide flood where only this family, from which only this family survived. And uh, uh, this approach, this paradigm also implies that uh, what we read about in Genesis chapter 10, the uh, generations after Noah, that these are ancestors of people groups that exist today. And uh, the young earth creationism approach also implies that uh, the, the world, uh, the tow Tower of Babel event, which, uh, uh, it, which uh, uh, is about geographic and linguistic dispersion, that this was a real event. And all these biblical claims can directly or indirectly be tested. The second paradigm, old earth creationism, it has many similarities with the young earth creationism paradigm, since most parts of Genesis chapters 1 to 11 are interpreted li literally, in particular that uh, God created different uh, groups of animals and, and plants uh, simply by his word from nothing. But there are also some important differences, in particular, Old Earth creationists have a non-literal interpretation of the timeline when God created the world in the first chapter of Genesis. And that implies that the world is old, several billion years old, and that animals existed long before the fall of man. And that also implies that death and suffering existed long before the fall of man. A, Old Earth creationists interpret the flood of Noah as a real event, but typically as a local event in the Mediterranean uh, region, not as a global, global, global worldwide event. And then we have the third uh, paradigm for questions of origin within Christianity, theistic evolution. And according to this approach, the first chapters of Genesis are not interpreted literally. And uh, theistic evolution is really Darwin's theory of evolution interpreted within Christian framework. And that implies that evolution is God's way of creating diversity on earth. And since, since Darwin's theory of evolution involves common ancestry between humans and other species, that means that the uniqueness of man is diminished. Although uh, Christians uh, adhering to theistic evolution think of the fall of man as real, still its historical interpretation becomes unclear. And also as for old earth creationism, death and suffering existed long before the fall of man. And typically theistic evolutionists don't think about the flood of Noah as a real event. So let's now look at one specific uh, uh, research question. So we start uh, uh, just to exemplify uh, these different paradigms. So th the research question is, how should human origin and diversity be explained? And then, we formulate two competing scientific theories. H1, uh, according to which humans were not created uniquely, but have common descent with chimps and other species. And, and the H2 theory, according to which humans descend uniquely from a first pair, Adam and Eve, that were created about 6,000 years ago without living ancestry. So it's clear that these two theories, they belong to different paradigms. So H1 is part of Darwinian evolution or the 
artistic evolution paradigm, whereas age two is part of the young earth creationist paradigm. But both of these scientific theories can be tested and they can be compared which theory explains uh, data the best. And uh, the most established method of, 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 of comparing scientific theories is referred to as the hypothetical, hypothetical deductive method of science. And this method has very old roots. Actually, uh, uh, the origin of this method goes back to the Greek uh, philosopher Aristoteles. Uh, and uh, the method was, to a large extent, fully developed by Christian medieval scholars, in particular the, uh, the British bishop and scientist uh, Robert uh, Grossetest in the early 13th century. The name of the method was, method was coined by the Austrian philosophy, philosopher of science, Karl Popper, in the 1930s. And the method was uh, uh, further developed by the Hungarian philosopher of science, Imre Lakatos. So let's explain how this method of science works. So the hypothetical didactic method of science starts by posing a research question, like the one I mentioned before. How should we uh, explain origin and diversity of humans? And then we formulate a number of possible scientific theories or hypotheses, H1, H2, and so, uh, so on, for answering the research question Q. And I mentioned for this particular uh, research question of human origin that we had H1 as an evolutionary hypothesis where humans share ancestry with other species. And the young earth creationist th uh, theory according to which uh, humans descend uniquely from Adam and Eve, who lived about 6,000 years ago. And we can formulate these scientific theories based on previous research, experience, and even on intuition. And then the third step of the hypothetical didactic method is to deduce the consequences of each theory. And we do that using logical reasoning, initial conditions, laws of nature, and so on. For instance, for the uh, creationist theory H2, uh, where, which postulates that uh, humans descend from Adam and Eve uh, 6,000 years ago, the initial condition could be, how did God create uh, Adam and Eve genetically? What was the genetic makeup of Adam and Eve? And then the laws of nature, it would be Mendel's laws of inheritance uh, telling us how uh, the, uh, the uh, genetic makeup of Adam and Eve was, uh, was transferred to, to subsequent generations through inheritance. And then we have the fourth step of the hypothetical didactic method of science, where we compare the logical consequences of each theory with data. So we check which theory explains the data we have at hand the best, but we also want to know which theory is best at predicting new data. And if it turns out that none of the two theories, H1 or H2, work well, then we have, have to come up with no new ones, H3, H4, and so on, and go back to step two and go through these different steps of the hypothetical didactic method of science. And this is how science works. We sort of attain or uh, improve our scientific theories all the time. So we sort of iterate through these steps, uh, two, three, four, many times over uh, uh, the history of science. And in order now to uh, single out the best scientific theory so far, there are a number of important criteria within this hypothetical didactic method. So we need a number of criteria for selecting scientific theories. And uh, the first three, uh, 
criteria come from step two of, of uh, uh, the hypothetical didactic method of science, when we uh, choose which scientific theories should be able to compete or should be able to be tested in the first place. The first criterion is relevance. A scientific theory has to be relevant for the research question being, ans being asked. The second uh, criterion is simplicity. If two theories explain or predict data equally well, choose the simpler one. So for instance, uh, it's often good to have constants of nature, not changing with time if possible. That is a simpler theory. That doesn't mean that they are not allowed to change with time, but that would be sort of a simplicity criterion. Uh, the third criterion is that a scientific theory should be possible to falsify. It should theoretically be possible to come up with uh, um, data that could potentially falsify the theory, and that makes it testable. For instance, if we happen to find uh, fossils that are intermediate between mans and chimps, that was sort of, uh, if not falsify, but lay, make the creationist theory less likely. Uh, whereas if we don't find such intermediate forms, uh, the evolutionary hypothesis for human origins is, uh, if not falsified, at least made less likely. The fourth criterion is called methodological naturalism. And According to this criterion, only theories with natural explanations are allowed. And this concept should not be confused with naturalism or ontological naturalism. Naturalism is the belief that only things in the natural exist. Methodolo methodological naturalism is a principle uh, by which only uh, concepts from the natural world are allowed in science. So that's not uh, the same thing. So uh, there are many scientists who are not naturalists, but they still adhere to methodological naturalists when they do science. And this method has uh, old roots, actually, from the Greek philosopher Thales uh, uh, in ancient Greek and other uh, ancient Greek philosophers. And the method became increasingly pop popular since the 70s and 80s, hundreds, and, uh, um, but the term was actually coined very recently in the 1990s, uh, when the theory of intelligent design was formed and some critics of that theory uh, introduced methodological naturalism, how they thought science should be uh, um, defined. And then we have the two last criteria, criteria for selecting scientific theories. And they come from the fourth step of the hypothetical didactic method of science. Uh, and as I mentioned on, on the previous slide, the scientific theory should be able to explain data well, and it should be able to predict future data well. So all in all, we now have six criteria for uh, selecting uh, scientific theories. So let's look at, upon these criteria in more detail. So I would say that five of these criteria are very important and uncontroversial. Uncro Relevance, simplicity, testability or, fo uh, or falsifiability, explainability and predictability. These are all very important scientific criteria. But it's the sixth criterion methodological naturalism that uh, can be called into question because this criterion favors secular theories and it's based on a purely philosophical assumption. And it's actually this um, uh, principle, it dominates in academia. As I said, uh, um, it started to do so more and more since the 70s and 1800s and, and today it dominates uh, a lot in academia. And that is the reason why creationism, young or old earth creationism, is marginalized because of this principle, because 
uh, creation is, is not considered a science simply because it does not fulfill the, the criterion of methodological naturalism, which is a completely secular philosophical assumption. So my conclusions are the following. A scientific theory, including creationist uh, scientific theories, uh, a, a scientific theory which is relevant to the research question being asked, which is not overly complicated, which is testable, which explains data well, and which makes good prediction. That's a good scientific theory. Whereas the principle of methodological naturalism should, in my view, be avoided because it favors secular theories and is closed and it excludes creationist ones. And moreover, it hinders academic freedom and search for the truth. And uh, in the subsequent talks of this uh, creationist day, various creationist theories will be presented from physics, geology, biology, and genetics. And they all, and they satisfy all these five important criteria of science, but it, they do not satisfy methodological naturalism. But if, since, in my view, it's only the five first criteria that are important, I would say that all these subsequent talk, they represent good science. Thanks for the attention.